Live coverage of the House as they uh, continue to work on a spending bill for energy departments, and they'll also be looking at uh, legislation on uh, flood insurance. We'll be back tomorrow morning. Live coverage uh, here on C-SPAN of the House of Representatives. The Speaker's Rooms, Washington, D.C., July 12, 2011. I hereby appoint the Honorable Anne Marie Burkle to act as Speaker pro tempore on this day. Signed, John A. Boehner, Speaker of the House of Representatives. Pursuant to the order of the House of January 5, 2011, the Chair will now recognize members from lists submitted by the majority and the minority leaders for morning hour debate. The chair will alternate recognition between the parties, with each party limited to one hour and each member other than the majority and the minority leaders, and the minority whip limited to five minutes each. But in the event, no sh shall debate continue beyond 11.50 a.m. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Poe, for five minutes. Madam Speaker, we are worse off now than we were in 2008. The country is suffering through an economic recession with more long-term unemployment than during the Great Depression. The, the economy was in bad shape, but this administration has made it worse. The unconstitutional government takeover of health care created a cloud of uncertainty for small business owners stalling job growth. Our health care system was in trouble before, but this administration has made it worse. Our country is spiraling toward a domestic energy crisis thanks to the administration's insistence on punishing U.S. oil companies. The price of energy was high before, but this administration makes it worse. Americans are becoming used to living with the word crisis. Under Obamaism, crisis has become the new status quo. The president admits we're on a bumpy road, but Mr. President, this road is full of potholes. The national debt is expected to equal 101% of the economy in 10 years. Unemployment is around 9.2%. Home sales have declined. The number of food stamp recipients has skyrocketed. Over the past three years, we have witnessed an administration set on entitling people and paying them not to work, as opposed to helping businesses hire people to work. We are worse off now than we were before the president stepped foot on 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. We are stuck in this hole because the White House policies have been toxic to countries, this country's job creators. Businesses do not operate like the government does. They don't function under short-term budgets. They don't plan for the next six days or six months like our government does. Business owners want a plan. They want to know what will happen next. And under this cloud of uncertainty, businesses face Obamacare's employer mandate and an onslaught of costly government regulations. This leaves them with few choices. Hold tight and wait it out, or comply with government oppression and suffer, or shut down and move overseas. Coming up on this bumpy road is the domestic energy shortage. The White House seeks to punish the energy of today and tomorrow in favor of potential energy of after our lifetimes. An energy agenda that is synonymous with stall obstruct, discourage, and penalize will only devastate the economy further and force more businesses and jobs to go away. We've seen the administration slow walk the approval process for offshore drilling permits despite lifting the moratorium. The delays have been costly, so costly that rigs have left the Gulf of Mexico never to return, and those jobs will not return either. The coming domestic energy shortage will be partly due to the White House's desire to help foreign nations with their domestic energy instead of maximizing our own God-given natural resources. When the President told Brazil that America would help expand its offshore drilling operations and be one of its best customers, he sent a clear message. He doesn't support U.S. oil, U.S. companies, or U.S. workers. Each day that passes without a decision on the Keystone XL pipeline, a pipeline that will transport oil shells from our stable neighbor to the north right down to my congressional district in Texas is another day the White House pivots on U.S. energy jobs. Meanwhile, China is eager and ready to be Canada's customer if we snub Canada on the pipeline. The White House has a none from below mentality. We need all of the above strategy that encourages use of our natural resources and puts Americans back to work. 
The administration has mastered the art of turning a crisis into an opportunity to shove unpopular policies through. Over a year after the Deepwater Horizon explosion, the, the administration has come as close as it can to shutting down operations in the Gulf. 12,000 jobs have been lost. Are we better off today than we were 2008? No, our economy is still in crisis of uncertainty. The answers under Obamaism are to increase government control over our lives and raise taxes on people who pay taxes. This plan is an attack on freedom. More government spending and control is the problem, not the solution. As Senator Rubio has said, instead of raising taxes, we should have more taxpayers. More new taxpayers under the concept of developing more businesses. More jobs also yield more taxpayers. This will create revenue. The White House has operated under crisis management. The doctrine of Obamaism with its expansion of the government has made America worse. It is time for new hope, new change, and a new American day. And that's just the way it is. I yield back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. DeFazio, for five minutes. We're in the tenth year of the uh, Bush tax cuts and the third year of the Obama tax cuts. Taxes today are at the lowest percentage of our national economy since 1950. And of course, that pre exists a few things like Medicare, Homeland Security massive uh, spending on uh, wars overseas, etc. Yet last Friday, uh, with this very, very uh, light tax burden, we had uh, the official unemployment numbers. They were horrible. But guess what? The reality is worse than the numbers. There's about 20 million people, not 16 million people, unemployed, looking for work, or underemployed. So I guess all we need to do is cut taxes more and cut spending, and we'll have an economic boom. Yeah, we'll have a boom, like boom of an imploding economy, just like the last 10 years, the worst job creation since the Great Depression under this theory that tax cuts solve every problem. Now, the President's response on Friday was, not surprisingly, continue tax cuts. The new one he's adopted is the Social Security tax holiday. But don't worry, we'll make Social Security whole. If we cut their income, we've got to make the trust fund whole. We'll borrow $110 billion from China. We'll put it into the Social Security trust fund, and everybody will get 15 or 20 bucks a week, and that'll solve the problems of this economy. Of course, it doesn't do much for the people who aren't working, and it's not going to create jobs. That's his big solution. Number two solution, more job-killing free trade agreements. Oh, that's great. Patent reform. Yeah, maybe, someday. And then, oh, at the very end, Oh, we should have a little bitty infrastructure bank. Oh, great. Okay. Now, the Republicans on Thursday, uh, they preceded all this and one upped them. They proposed that the United States of America, with crumbling highways, falling down bridges, and obsolete transit systems, cut investment infrastructure by 35%. So the construction industry that has today 16% unemployment, under the Republican plan, 25% unemployment. That's great. That's going to work, too. Oh, yeah, and more tax cuts. You know, we lack the will around here to address our nation's greatest problems, not the means. Chronic unemployment is the greatest problem in this country. If we solve chronic unemployment, a quarter of the deficit goes away because those people aren't collecting unemployment benefits, food stamps, and other things they need just to survive, and they're working and paying taxes. Now, how about canceling some of these stupid tax cuts? particularly the Social Security tax holiday. Let's not borrow $110 billion from China for people to dribble away in $20 a week payments. Let's take that $110 billion and build things in America with American workers and buy America requirements. We could put four or five million people to work. Let's cancel the tax cuts for people over $200,000 a year, the job creators who are pretty undertaxed right now and have record savings and wealth. And if they contributed a little bit, ah, that would be about another million jobs if we put that $23 billion a year into investment in infrastructure. And these aren't just construction jobs. They're engineering jobs. They're manufacturing jobs. They're small business suppliers. We need an investment-driven recovery. For too long, we've been trying, under both Bush and under Obama, to have a borrowed money, consumption-driven recovery. Ain't going to work. 
not good long term, indebting our kids and giving them nothing but calorie consumption. Let's have something that's investment driven that will provide benefits for generations to come with a 21st century infrastructure for this country. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Murphy, for five minutes. Well, while deliberations continue about dealing with our $14.3 trillion deficit while, or debt, while deliberations continue on dealing with raising the debt ceiling, Americans are very concerned about where we're going. June unemployment at 9.2 percent and a growth of only 18,000 jobs translates to a meager 360 jobs per state. Now, when you look at how many high school students graduated in June, that's 3.7 million. Colleges graduated 1.7 million. That 360 jobs barely equals the size of a typical large American high school graduating class and certainly barely covers students at one typical college per state with a typical major. No wonder Americans are worried about our economy when so many youth are entering the job market only to find there are no jobs. So while our leaders on both sides of the aisle are delivering, unfortunately, uh, too much of this in the media becomes a battle of words, let's keep in mind that one way to balance America's budget, one very important way to deal with America's debt is to grow jobs. For each 1% decline in unemployment, it's $90 billion per year in federal revenue. That's a decrease in unemployment compensation. That's an increase in federal revenues. That's 1.5 million jobs for every 1% decline in unemployment. And let me again quote our colleague from across the building here, Senator Rubio, who said this is not about increasing taxes, it's about increasing taxpayers, and this could do it. Now, the cost per job in the failed stimulus bill was at least 278,000 based upon 660 billion spent. Of course, that number per job increases dramatically and rapidly if you include the interest paid on that stimulus bill, which takes us over the $1 trillion mark. That sort of approach is not going to work, and if we open our eyes, we can all honestly admit that. Increasing unemployment is not going to decrease the federal debt or deficit. We have to grow our way out of this. A bill that I've introduced and several colleagues in a bipartisan way have signed on as co-sponsors, and I ask my colleagues to join on as co-sponsors, would be H.R. 1861. This bill would allow us to say instead of sending $129 billion a year to OPEC for foreign aid to buy their oil, we drill for and we use our own. It would yield somewhere between $2.2 trillion and $3.7 trillion over a 30-year period in federal revenues, not from raising taxes, but from using the standard royalties and lease agreements that come from this. It starts out as a crawl and increases to a walk and then into a run as this money comes through. But what we do in this bill is about growth in America. It isn't just talking about it, but it's putting our money where our jobs are. Because it leads to 1.2 million jobs annually based upon estimates of the American Energy Alliance. That's jobs making steel, making steel pipes, wires, software, technology. It's, it's jobs for the roughnecks, it's the steel workers, the electricians and the laborers who work on these rigs. It's jobs for those who take this oil and convert it into gasoline, and it's jobs for those who have to put together all the infrastructure to make that happen. But beyond that, what we do is we dedicate these funds into the infrastructure which America needs. According to the American Society for Civil Engineers, we need over $2 trillion to deal with our current infrastructure needs. Many states find that 25 percent of their roads and bridges are structurally deficient. That's unsafe. But for every $1 billion we spend on our infrastructure, it yields 38,000 jobs. Those jobs for operating engineers and laborers and carpenters or electricians and, and engineers and those who make concrete and steel and all the things that go with what we need for our roads, our highways, our bridges, our locks, our dams, our water and sewer systems. Let's grow our way back to prosperity. Let's stop saying we're going to send money to OPEC and watch them grow. Let's stop just pointing fingers and blaming and complaining about China. We have the tools here in America to make this happen. So while our leaders are over at the White House arguing about how to take care of the debt, let's not forget that overall Americans are saying one way to grow out of this debt is to grow more jobs, to grow more taxpayers, not just to find ways of taxing them. We can do this. 
And again, I ask my colleagues to join me in H.R. 1861 where we can do this. Let's not talk about jobs and let's not complain about it. Americans know when they're, the wool is being pulled over their eyes and Americans know when they're working. Let's truly help them out and get jobs back on the table. I yield back. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Woolsey, for five minutes. Madam Speaker, in April of the year 2004, my staff came to me with a memo asking if I wanted to give a special order speech on some issue that I, I can't remember the subject. Uh, my answer at that time was no, I, I didn't want to speak on that issue. But I did want to deliver a five-minute speech that day and every day thereafter when it was possible uh, to express my opposition to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and my belief that there is a smarter way to achieve our national security goals. And so, Madam Speaker, since that day, I've stood here in this spot to say over and over again that these wars are eroding our spiritual core, bankrupting us morally and fiscally, teaching our children that warfare is the new normal. I have delivered these speeches as a member of the majority and the minority when the president was a member of my party and when he was not, and today I am doing it for the 400th time. When I began, the war in Iraq was still quite popular, as was the president who launched it. But we spoke out anyway, refusing to bend on principle because we knew that we did not belong there. My colleagues, uh, Representative Barbara Lee and uh, Representative Max, Maxine Waters and I, we called ourselves the Triad, started the Out of Iraq Caucus and we first forced the first House vote to bring our troops home. Along the way, I visited Iraq. I tried uh, and I learned on that trip and, it, and my opinion was confirmed against that very war. But at the same time, it increased my admiration for our troops. Gradually, the tide of public opinion has turned. President Bush lost the confidence of the American people and eventually had to start winding down the war. I don't believe that would have happened unless a few lonely voices had dared to be heard in those early, early days. I'm proud of what we've accomplished, but I'm also very frustrated because nearly a decade after the first American boots hit the ground in Afghanistan, here we are, still at war, still occupying sovereign countries on missions that aren't making us safer or advancing our interests. The cost has been devastating. Over 6,100 Americans are dead. Thousands more civilians have died for the cause of their so-called liberation. Thousands of U.S. service members have come home but may never be the same, either because of physical wounds or mental health trauma, which can with the physical and the mental health, destroy lives just as well. In addition to the staggering $3.2 trillion price tag that has piled up over the last 10 years, I don't think we've even begun to come to grips with the resources that the VA will need for the next 50 or so years to meet the responsibility we have to our veterans as a result of these wars. Madam Speaker, you know, I've said it over and over again, that I'm not suggesting we abandon the people of Afghanistan and Iraq. Anti-war doesn't mean anti-engagement or anti-security. The underlying principle behind my 400 speeches has been that we need a completely different approach to protecting America. One that emphasizes diplomacy, reconciliation, and peaceful conflict resolution. From the beginning, I've been pushing my own solution called smart security, fighting terrorism with better intelligence, with a stronger nuclear nonproliferation program, with humanitarian and economic aid that will give hope to the people around the world. With less spending on weapons systems and more on homeland security, human rights monitoring, and energy independence. Most importantly, smart security insists that war is an absolute last resort. 
Because, Madam Speaker, for the sake of the future of the human race, the future of the human race, we must and we can figure out a way to resolve our differences without resorting to war and violence. I will continue to this for the remaining year and a half that I will be in Congress, giving as many of these speeches as I can. And Madam Speaker, I will not rest until we finally bring our troops home and we adopt a smart security approach to preventing war and preserving peace so that my grandchildren and your grandchildren and their grandchildren will have a peaceful, productive world to live in in the future. I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Landry, for five minutes. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, let me help this body interpret how the American people see this debt crisis. Now, some of you may question, how can I, with this accent, provide an interpretation? Well, let me show you. Americans have a keen understanding of how credit cards work. They know that each card holds a limit on it. And this limit is the borrowing limit on that particular card. And it is a fact when one reaches the limit on his or her card that they are unable to borrow more money or charge more at that time. Now, it is not factual to say, however, that one max when one maxes out his credit card that he is in default personally or, in layman's term, that he is bankrupt. No, when one reaches his limit, you simply cannot use the card anymore. If you want to continue to use the card, you need to pay down on the principal amount that is owed. Now, if and when you reach this unfortunate circumstance, you and your family are required to live within your means. As long as you can continue to pay the interest on the card and the bills that you have accrued, then you are not in jeopardy of defaulting. Of course, you can only do this if you are employed and you have income, unlike the approximately 9.2% of Americans out there who are looking for us to do everything we can to help create private sector jobs. So this is where we are. Look, I don't believe if we fail to, re to raise the debt ceiling that we will default. What I do believe is not raising the debt ceiling will finally require Congress to make the tough decisions necessary to restore fiscal sanity to our federal government. It will force Congress to understand that at this time, we need to live within our means. Why? Because going back to our layman's term, if the federal government was a person, that person is not unemployed. They still have a job, unlike the approximately 9.2% of Americans I spoke earlier about. So if we still have a job, that means we're still getting a paycheck. That paycheck is currently sufficient to pay our bills. After two years where the president and previous Congresses spent like they were going out of style, the president is starting to understand that we have spent too much. What he hasn't realized yet, and I hope he does, is that we don't have a revenue problem here. We have a spending problem. Now, I know that we would like to spend more on things we like. That is human nature. But the reason so many of us are opposed to increasing taxes is that our constituents are opposed to increasing taxes. Make no mistake about it. If the American people believed that an increase in taxes would once and for all eliminate our debt problems here in this country, they would support it. But you see, this institution has a credibility problem. In fact, the entire federal government has a credibility problem with the American people. They, the American people do not have confidence in our ability to be prudent with their tax dollars. Do you blame them? When over the course of the last two years, we've spent over $3 trillion on money, on stimuluses and bailouts, promising that we would increase their opportunity to be more financially secure. And of course, that didn't happen. The proof is in the pudding. We spent the money, and guess what? No results. We have a spending problem. Why? Because so many politicians here who have been here for a long time believe that everything in the budget is a need, not a want. As a parent of a young child, I'm constantly have, having to explain to him the difference between needs and wants. So, 
the longtime politicians here believe that government is the solution to everything. Well, my friends, believe you me, some of us know it's not, and the vast majority of people know it's not. Trust me. Trust me. We need to, we must get serious. Washington is not an elastic piggy bank that, that is able to continue to fund everyone's wants. Let's get serious. Let's quit spending what we don't have. Let's restore credibility. And we do this by cutting spending through prioritizing. It is that simple. Restore credibility. Restore trust. Get down to creating certainty, reducing red tape, and creating jobs. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Rangel, for five minutes. <clears throat> My colleagues, last week I tried to point out that there was a serious meeting going on in the White House last weekend uh, between the President and our congressional leaders to point out that we were facing a serious crisis and that we had to do something to make certain that the President felt secure that we would increase the debt ceiling and that we would uh, make certain that we did stop this uh, unnecessary spending. And of course, the question of revenues has always been a part of the debate. What I was trying to do was to point out that on one side, it appeared the issue was that we shouldn't tax those people that created jobs. And these are people, as people have pointed out, well, the wealthiest corporation that have record profits and, uh, and of course, the wealthy that have really have the lowest tax rates and have received uh, more money in the last decade than in the history of the country. And I was really trying to say that since the vulnerable and the poor did not have any lobbyists or voices to, to debate this issue, that when we talk about entitlements, uh, when we... Uh, talk about Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, these are not just political labels. Uh, the, the, the Medicaid, of course, we're talking about the vulnerable, the, the poor, and those who are sick. Uh, Medicare, we're talking about the aged that need help. I was also pointing out that, unfortunately, Social Security has become the main income for so many Americans. And we have veterans that are coming home. We have the jobless, the homeless, the, uh, the hopeless. And that even though they did not have a lobbyist to say, hey, I want to have a seat at that table, that I called to all of our spiritual leaders since I knew that in every religion there was a good Samaritan aspect which really ended up saying, just do the right thing. I didn't put politics in it. I didn't put party labels in it. And I wasn't just talking to Christians and, and ministers and Catholics and Protestants. I was reaching out to the rabbis, to the imams, to the Buddhists, to the Mormons, to the, uh, to the Muslims, and saying that in every scripture, uh, in every religious document, taking care of the vulnerable and those can't take care, of the, take care of themselves, that that moral issue should be on the table. Well, as a result of that, some people thought that instead of just the Good Samaritan, I would ask what Jesus would do. And I just want to make it clear, I haven't the slightest idea what he would do. But my very dear friend, Governor Huckabee, I said one of the things that Jesus would do would be to pay his taxes. And, of course, that uh, was something that uh, reminded me. He also went to uh, Deuteronomy, and it said, and he cited on TV, For the Lord your God would bless you as he promised, and he would lend many nations, but would borrow from none. And you would rule over many nations, but none would rule over you. Well, again, that scored uh, for, 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 for the good governor, but however, when you got a $14.3 trillion uh, debt, uh, it's kind of late for, for that message to have a strong impact. But what I want to make clear is that no matter what religion you are, uh, 
I, it appears to me that what we're talking about are two sides of sincere Americans that do recognize that this is not just saying that the sky may fall. All economists agree that there are various ways to do it, and we cannot just cut back spending uh, in order to resolve this serious economic problem we have. As a matter of fact, we have to be very sensitive when we do cut back spending that we don't create an addition to the unemployment and those that provide services to the disadvantages. And I'm talking specifically about our hospitals, about our social workers, because there's no one in this chamber that doesn't believe that the homeless and the sick, those that are disabled, and those that are dependent on these programs should be ignored as we protect those people who, for whatever reason, have not participated in the creation of those jobs, even though we all are waiting. But more importantly, we have not heard any complaints from the wealthiest of Americans that more equity should be involved in our taxing system. When the billionaires can say that their secretaries have a higher tax rate than they do, it means that we have a responsibility not to raise taxes, but at least to close the inequity that exists that would raise revenue. So when we do get home, it seems to me that we expired. would say this is not a Democratic issue. This is not a Republican issue alone. It is a moral issue. Thank you, Governor Huckabee. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Thompson, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to recognize and honor a true patriot, humanitarian, and all-around great America, Colonel Gerald F. Russell, United States Marine Corps of Center County, Pennsylvania. Colonel Gerald F. Russell is a combat veteran of Guadalcanal, Korea, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and World War II, including the Battle of Iwo Jima, which remains today a seminal event in our nation's history. May 1st was Colonel Russell's birthday. I use this time to celebrate his service to our country and his thankless contributions to our local communities of central Pennsylvania. Mr. Speaker, May 1st, 1916 was the beginning of a long life of service. In 1940, Colonel Gerald F. Russell graduated from Boston College, enlisted in the first U.S. Marine Corps Office Candidates class, and later that year was commissioned the second lieutenant of the United States Marine Corps. He was assigned to the 11th Marines, 1st Marine Division, Paris Island, South Carolina, and then promoted to first lieutenant. In September 1942, Colonel Russell landed in the assault waves on Guadalcanal in the first U.S. offensive of World War II. He was promoted to captain that very same day, assigned as battery commander, ship and hit, it was hit by Japanese aircraft during landing, which later sank. Uh, Colonel Russell suffered shrapnel wounds during the campaign, was not evacuated, and soon contracted malaria. Shortly after, he moved with the 1st Marine Division to Melbourne, Australia, and ultimately returned to the U.S. to recover. From 1943 to 1945, Russell was assigned to attend the United States Marine Corps Command and Staff College. He was assigned to the 5th Marine Division, Camp Lejeune, as Ar Artillery Battalion Exec. Promoted to Major and transferred from Artillery to Infantry. And with 5th Marine Division, he transferred to Hawaii as Infantry Battalion Executive Officer. As Battalion Executive Officer, Russell landed in the third assault wave on Iwo Jima, Red Beach 1, where he observed the historic flag raising. Despite wounds to his face and being evacuated, uh, Russell volunteered to stay and lead the battalion after his commander went down. On the 10th day, Russell was elevated to infantry battalion commander, one of the youngest battalion commanders in World War II, and so served for the remainder of the campaign. Russell commanded one of two units to land in Japan for occupation at Kashushu and provided protection for the U.S. technical teams covering the atomic bomb site at Nagasaki. Commander Russell accepted the surrender of Tsushima Island off the coast of J the Japanese mainland. He was then returned to the U.S. and was assigned to the Staff Officers Basic School in Quantico, Virginia, where he served as instructor. In 1949, Russell was assigned to the 1st Marine Division, Korea, where he served as Commander of Frontline Infantry Battalion for eight months and as Chief of the Advisory Group of a Frontline Co Korean Marine Brigade for eight months. When he returned to the U.S., he was signed to the Marine Corps Research and Development Staff in Quantico, Virginia. In 1952, Russell was, was assigned to Staff U.S. European Command, Paris, France. That year, he returned to headquarters U.S. Marine Corps in Washington, D.C., and later transferred to, 
to Quantico, assigned as director of the Amphibious Warfare School, transferred to Camp Lejeune, then appointed commanding officer of the 8th Marine Infantry Regiment. Later, Russell was transferred to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, to command U.S. Ground Defense Force during the early difficulties with Cuba. In 1967, Colonel Russell was transferred to Headquarters Marine Corps, Washington, D.C., where he served as Head Marine Corps Division of Morale Services until his retirement from the Marine Corps in 1968. Russell retired from the Marine Corps on a Friday and started work on Monday as the assistant to the provost at Penn State University. While at Penn State, Colonel Russell served as assistant to the provost, assistant to President Oswald, and assistant secretary for the Penn State Board of Trustees, assistant professor and assistant dean uh, to, to dean of the College of Health and Physical Education as associate dean until his retirement in 1987. Since his retirement from Penn State, Colonel Russell has continued as a tireless community volunteer, volunteer advocate, and is known throughout central Pennsylvania and beyond. Today, Colonel Russell serves as a member of the Center County United, Board, United Way Board of Directors, Chairman of the Center County United Way, the Day of Caring, and remains active in various efforts, which includes the Pennsylvania Special Olympics, Center County Toys for Tots, and many other programs that benefits our community. After a long and distinguished career, Colonel Russell has received the Republic of Korea Distinguished Service Medal, Bronze Star with V for Valor, the Navy Commendation Medal, the Army Commendation Medal, Purple Heart Medal with two gold stars, U.S. Presidential Citation with four stars, the Korean Presidential Unit Citation with three Navy stars, Meritorious Unit Citation, the Defense Medal, the Asiatic Pacific Medal with three stars, World War II Victory Medal, National Defense Medal, World War II J Japan Occupation Medal, United Nations Service Medal, Korean Service Medal, and among others for his eminent service to our country. A decorated veteran with almost three decades of active service, today Colonel Russell is one of just three living regimental commanders of Iwo Jima. The Battle of Iwo Jima served as a watershed moment for the United States in World War II. After capturing Iwo Jima, U.S. forces were able to have a staging ground for the aerial assault that would help defeat the Japanese Empire. Gentlemen's time has expired. I want to thank Colonel Russell for his service and to this great nation. A happy birthday, Colonel Russell. Gen gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Lee, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise uh, today, first of all, to pay tribute to a true champion for peace and justice, Congresswoman Lynn Woolsey. Her leadership is reflected in the fact that today marks the 400th occasion on which she has spoken on the House floor against the ongoing war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan. Today is really a landmark, not only because of Congresswoman Woolsey's outstanding commitment to ending the wars we are engaged in, but also because uh, she's my good friend and she will be retiring at the end of this term. I was truly honored to be by her side when she announced her retirement after 20 years of bold and visionary service in this house and serving her district. Uh, it was a bittersweet occasion, but uh, I know she will do wonderful things in the next chapter of her life. Congresswoman Woolsey should really be commended for being an unparalleled leader and a guiding light, a truly guiding light in Congress for peace, for smart security, and for justice. Madam Speaker, I would also like to thank Congresswoman Woolsey for her unwavering leadership and commitment to end the unsustainable wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. She uh, introduced the very first resolution calling for us to bring our young brave men and women home from Iraq. I believe she pulled together then, what, 130 votes maybe for that resolution. And I want to remind you, this was a time when this body was, quite frankly, very timid uh, in its opposition to the war. She broke that silence, and I have to thank you for that very historic moment, Congresswoman Woolsey. Now we must ensure that the 45,000 United States troops and our military contractors who remain in Iraq leave the country at the leave Iraq at the end of this year, as stated in our National Status of Forces Agreement with Iraq. Congresswoman Woolsey's fight to end these wars is directly tied to really the impasse that we're facing over our nation's debt limit, which we're discussing today. She has tirelessly reminded this body time and time again that in order to pay for these wars, the United States has taken on incredible debt. 
This reckless spending and resulting debt are now being used by many uh, in a dangerous political game which threatens the economic future of our country. Allowing our government to default on this nation's legal obligations would threaten every American's economic security, it would devastate people's retirement savings, and it would cripple an already struggling housing market. The truth is, and Congresswoman Woolsey always reminds us of this, is that raising the debt ceiling should be really a very simple thing. This should be a straightforward vote to allow the United States Treasury to fund all of the programs and obligations of the entire federal government that are already in the law. Very simple. Republicans in the House have already passed a $9 trillion increase in the national debt. And now, instead of working to fund the programs that they already voted to authorize, the Republicans are playing a high-stakes game of chicken and the safety and security of every single American so that they protect the massive tax breaks for the super-rich, big oil, and, of course, hedge funds. They've taken an incredibly irresponsible position that protecting tax breaks for the super-rich and Wall Street is more important than protecting the United States government and Main Street from defaulting on our debts. And again, Congresswoman Woolsey has been a leader in protecting Social Security. And I want to remind all of us today that Social Security and Medicare did not create the national debt. And that it's really unconscionable to ask our most vulnerable communities to be the ones who must bear the burden of balancing our budgets. It was Republicans who told us that the financial markets would regulate themselves. In return, what did we get? The financial crisis. It's the Republican politicians who keep telling us that tax cuts pay for themselves and create jobs. In return, we have a huge deficit and an unacceptable unemployment rate. And it was the Republicans who told us that we could fight two wars while giving more tax breaks to their rich friends. Of course, Congresswoman Woolsey, for years and years and years, had reminded us that, first of all, the wars did not need to be fought, but secondly, they were morally and fiscally wrong. In return, now we'll end up paying a cost of nearly $6 trillion by borrowing the money and adding this to the tally of our nation's debt. And now, unfortunately, Republicans are blaming their debts on the most vulnerable Americans. Even now, they continue to drive our nation closer and closer to the brink of disaster just to protect massive tax breaks for billionaires. So once again, let me just say in closing, I'm proud to stand here with Congresswoman Woolsey as a member of the triad. She's working to end our nation's wars, will continue to do so, to promote national security and to protect our seniors and our children, our working families and the most vulnerable Americans. Thank you. We owe you, Congresswoman Woolsey, a debt of gratitude. The chair recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Jones, for five minutes. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, thank you for the recognition. I, uh, on the floor today, I think America and all of us in Congress are certainly concerned about the debt ceiling issue and what we're going to do and how we're going to be able to resolve it. But I, like many of my colleagues, especially on the Democratic side, I'm here today to talk about the war in Afghanistan. Ms. Madam Speaker, I have beside me a, a really profound photograph of a wife in tears and a little girl sitting on her knee who is too young to understand that her father, United States Army Jeffrey Shear, laid under the flag that is now folded being presented to the wife. This is the pain of war. And I do say to Ms. Woolsey, thank you very much for what you've done to try to wake up the Congress and the American people. Ten billion dollars a month. We can't even fix the bridges, we can't fix the roads, we're cutting children's programs, we're cutting senior programs, and yet Mr. Karzai, who is known as a corrupt leader of Afghanistan, he's going to get his $10 billion a month while these programs that we're going to cut are going to be denied $10 billion a month. It doesn't make any sense, Madam Speaker. That brings me to an <clears throat> article written by A.C. Snow. He's well known in North Carolina where I'm from in his writings in the News and Observer, which is a state paper in Raleigh, North Carolina. In this past July the 4th, his article was titled, 
time to bring them home. Let them live. Time to bring them home. Let them live. Let, let this little girl's father live. Obviously, he will not live. He's dead. But how about the next little girl or the little boy or the wife and, in some cases, the husband? Let me share with the house from A.C. Snow's writing, Time to Bring Them Home, Let Them Live. It seems we never run out of wars. It is as if one small country after another sends out in a grave invitation reading, We're having a war. Please come. And Uncle Sam goes to lugging barred billions and thousands of young men and women to sacrifice on the altar of so-called freedom or nation building. Snow closes his comments by quoting lyrics from Le Miserable, and I quote, He is young. He is only a boy. You can take, you can give. Let him be. Let him live. Bring him home. Bring him home. And Snow further writes, it is way past time to start playing politics with the lives of American youth. Bring them home. Let them live. Not just 30,000 of them, but all of them. Madam Speaker, I sit here day after day, committees and on the floor of the House, listening to debates, sometimes being part of the debate. And I just hope that the American people will understand that in this discussion at the White House with the leadership of the House and the leadership of the Senate, we could save $100 billion. That's what it costs per year to be in Afghanistan. And Madam Speaker, I have Camp Lejeune Marine Base in my district. I have over 60,000 retired military. I listen to them. No, I did not serve. But I listen to those who are serving and those who did serve. And like my colleagues, I go to Walter Reed, I go to Bethesda, I see the broken bodies, the amputated legs, the paralyzed. And I have written over 10,300 letters to families like Sergeant Shear to say to the families, I regret that I voted to send our kids into Iraq. It was a lie that got us there and we never should have gone. So I join my colleagues in both parties to do my part to say, let's bring them home from Afghanistan. Let's bring them home before 2014 or 2015. And Madam Speaker, may God bless our men and women in uniform, and may God bless America. And I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Heinrich, for five minutes. Okay, sorry. Gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Hines. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to thank my Republican colleague from North Carolina for that very powerful statement. Uh, and I'm very glad that Congresswoman Woolsey was in the chamber to hear that, Congresswoman Woolsey, who has worked so hard to remind us of the terrible consequences of war. I often sit here as we debate and uh, seethe from time to time at the statements of uh, of our Republican colleagues, but that was profoundly moving, and I thank the gentleman from North Carolina. I stand today, Madam Speaker, to talk on another issue that should unite our parties, and that is the fundamental question about whether or not the United States honors its commitments. Today is July 12th, exactly three weeks before August 2nd. August 2nd is the date at which this government can no longer honor its commitments, at which it will be forced to choose between paying those soldiers that we heard so movingly described and sending out Social Security checks, running a court system, paying Social Security and Medicare. Do we honor our commitments in the United States of America? I would think that both parties would say yes to that question. The Treasury Secretary, CEOs of American corporations, economists after economists have told us, do not play around with the debt ceiling. What is this debt ceiling, by the way, that is putting into peril the question of whether we honor our commitments? The debt ceiling is a pernicious fiction. 
It is a fiction that was put in place by this body decades ago to try to convince the American people that we could control our debt. And since then, it has never done that. It has been raised dozens of times as this body took the spending decisions and the tax cut decisions that required borrowing. Under the Bush administration, the debt ceiling was raised seven times. Dozens and dozens of times the debt ceiling has been raised. It is a fiction. It is a particularly pernicious set of smoke and mirrors that this institution uses to make people feel better while the debt rises, as it did under President Reagan, as it did under the first President Bush, as it did not under the President Clinton, and as it did under President George W. Bush and President Obama. So now the question is, do we honor the commitments made historically in this chamber? We raise the debt ceiling not to spend more new money to start new programs or to cut new taxes, but because we honor the commitments that were made in this chamber. To cut taxes in 01 and 03, to go to war twice in the last decade, to add an expensive new drug benefit in Medicare. Look, these are all things that people supported and opposed, but we committed to do them as a body. And you cannot make those decisions. You cannot vote to lower taxes or to increase spending and then turn around and say, I'm not going to pay for that. That is the worst sort of hypocrisy. I'm glad that my friend from Louisiana, Mr. Landry, talked about credit cards, but he got it a little bit wrong. The debt ceiling is sort of like a credit card, but what we're talking about right now, because we're talking about paying for past decisions and commitments, would be if I went to the electronic store and bought myself a big screen TV, and I bought myself a new microwave, and I bought myself a new home security system, and then I get home and a month later I get the credit card bill and I say, huh, I don't know if I'm going to pay this credit card bill. I took the decisions. I made the commitments. And now the time has come to honor those commitments. Do we act as stewards of one of the best assets that this country has? Our full faith and credit. The belief that the United States honors its commitments. This is a critical asset, particularly now at a time of great economic uncertainty. Do we act as stewards of that full faith and credit, or do we use the debt ceiling as a gun to the head to say, unless you do X, Y, and Z, unless you cut $2 trillion or $3 trillion, we won't raise the debt ceiling, which is what we are hearing from the Republican side today. Do you use it? Do you hold it hostage, the full faith and credit of the United States? That is what we are seeing today. Look, there's no questions we need to address the deficit. We need to address the long-term sustainability of Medicare and Social Security in an equitable way. We should do that. And this president has basically put everything on the table, including making some of my colleagues on the Democratic side very uncomfortable with Social Security and Medicare. But he has put them on the table because there can be no sacred cows unless you're John Boehner or a Republican, and not everything is on the table, because we won't put the immense amount of spending we do for the tax code for advantages for oil companies, for advantages for big agriculture, for all sorts of tax breaks for corporations and others. We won't even talk about that. My friends, this comes down to the question of do we honor our commitments, and the, honor to, the answer to that question must be yes. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Coble, for five minutes. Thank you, thank you Madam Speaker. Uh, this week, uh, Madam Speaker, I will introduce a bill that will amend the rules applicable to participation in the Congressional Pension Plan. Under the present plan, a member, upon completion of five-year service, the pension vests. I believe a member should make a more firm commitment to become eligible uh, in, and therefore become eligible to participate in the plan. My bill, Madam Speaker, will increase the eligibility requirement from five years to 12 years. The, the bill, if enacted, will become effective at the convening of the 113th Congress. A member could serve six two-year House terms, two six-year Senate terms, or a combination thereof to become eligible to participate in the Congressional Pension Plan. If any colleagues are interested in my proposal, I will welcome co-sponsors to the bill. 
and yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Grijalva. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'm here uh, to join with uh, my colleagues in uh, thanking uh, the gentlelady from California, Ms. Woolsey, for all, all that she has done to provide leadership on an issue that has been critical to the American people, on an issue that she could very justifiably say, I told you so. And uh, since I've been in this uh, house, it's been my uh, distinct privilege to consider her a friend and to enjoy the leadership and the insight that she has provided to many of us. Uh, her position on Afghanistan is, is correct and a necessary position as we see these times before us. Americans who feel the sting of doing more with less are connecting the dots between federal spending priorities and the pain that they're feeling at home right now. Americans struggling to put their kids through college without any Pell Grants or running out of unemployment benefits with no new job on the horizon cannot ignore the cost of this war. The war cost the taxpayers in my congressional district more than $580 million so far. That's about 11,000 elementary school teachers that could be hired for a year or 84,000 students that could go to community college or a university or a trade school or a, a career school. These are just some of the bad trade-offs we're making by spending our national resources on a war instead of fixing the problems that we have here at home. Ask yourself, which would you rather have? A war that is not making us safer and, and then not worth the cost or a more educated, prosperous America? We cannot afford the nearly $10 billion per month while families struggle to stay afloat and the slow recovery of our nation continues. Keeping America safe does not require 100,000 troops in Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda is no longer in Afghanistan, but scattered across the world. It did not take 100,000 troops to find Osama bin Laden, and it does not take a military occupation of Afghanistan to protect us from terrorist threats. I am deeply proud of the hard work and incredible sacrifice of our brave men and women in uniform. We know they are carrying out the mission in, in Afghanistan with dedication and extraordinary competence. Throughout this nearly 10-year military campaign, they have done all we have asked of them and represented our nation's very best values and ideals. Now it's time to bring our troops home and bring them home to a new reality. Since the year 2000, we have lost 2 million jobs in this country, while we have added 30 million people to our population. After 10 years of a failed fiscal policy that brags about job creators through tax cuts, incentives, subsidies to corporations, this failed policy has, continues to be promoted as a solution to our economy and to the recession that we find ourselves in. We need to bring our troops home. We need to integrate them fully back into our, our society and into our country. And one of the best ways to do that is to provide jobs and opportunity. And one way is for the government to create jobs in public service and public works. By putting America back to work, we begin to crawl out of the hole that we have been in for the last 10 years. Afghanistan is a stark example of flawed priorities. And as we go forward uh, with the discussion of the debt ceiling, with how to balance this budget, how to articulate priorities that the American people uh, want, let us not forget that one of the priorities the American people have insisted on time and time again is to end these two misadventures in Iraq and Afghanistan, bring those troops home, redirect those resources to the needs that the American people face right now, and in this way, begin not only to make our economy better, but return some moral imperative to this nation. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Quayle, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, last Friday's jobs report was incredibly disappointing. We only added 18 to the U.S. economy. Our unemployment rate went up to 9.2%, not to mention the fact that we had a downgrade, a revision 
of last month's, of May's job report to only 25,000 jobs. The deeper you go into that jobs report, the worse it gets. Because for those who are underemployed, that's about 16% to 17% of the United States population. And that is not even including the 250,000 people who went off of the rolls of the unemployed because they just stopped looking for work. We've been talking about jobs for a long time. You hear it all the time in the halls of Congress. But what have we done? Now, the House has passed a number of bills that will immediately open up a marketplace for job creation and job growth. But unfortunately, our friends on the other side of the Capitol in the Senate have done nothing to advance these pieces of legislation. And it's not like they've had anything to do. I mean, they haven't even passed a budget in over 800 days. So I would ask our friends in the Senate to start to push these pro-growth economic policies so we can get Americans back to work. But it's not just our friends on the other side of the Capitol that are holding us back. It's the administration who has pursued policies that have hurt job creation and economic growth. You know, to be a good manager, to be a good executive, you have to be able to do two things well. One is to be able to analyze and pinpoint a problem, and the second part is to find a solution for that problem. Unfortunately, we have an administration that doesn't even do the first part well. They actually pinpoint problems that don't exist or problems that aren't problems at all. So you can't even get to a solution that will get Americans back to work. I'll give you a couple examples of this. Recently, the president said that one of the problems we have with job creations are with ATMs and kiosks at our airport. Now, I didn't know about the scourge of ATMs and kiosks, but apparently those were holding back our job creators. This is called innovation. This is called efficiency. And it reminds me of a story of when the famed econo economist Milton Friedman went to, uh, to China, and he was witnessing some excavation for a canal. And there were thousands of people who were digging with shovels. And, and Milton Friedman asked, he goes, well, why aren't you guys using bulldozers or excavators? Those things will make this more efficient. And the Chinese officials said, well, you know, then we couldn't put these people to work. And to that, Milton Friedman responded, well, why don't you give them spoons? Look, innovation and efficiency make our country stronger. They're net job creators. So we should be going after what is really holding our country back and is really holding back economic growth. And that is the NLRB, who is attacking American companies who want to create American jobs. That is the EPA, who is going after numerous pieces of regulation that will, in the near term, kill jobs, in the medium term, kill jobs, in the long term, kill jobs. We should be going after the FTC, who is now going after Captain Crunch and Tony the Tiger. Those sorts of things are the ones that are holding our country back and holding back economic growth. We should be looking at those burdening regulations and removing that and letting our entrepreneurs and our job creators unleash the ingenuity that they have within them. Now, there's one th area of agreement that I do have with the president, and that is with the free trade agreements. The free trade agreements with South Korea, Colombia, and Panama need to be passed through the House. But we've got to agree on something. They have been sitting on the president's desk since he's been in office. So I urge the president to send those free trade agreements without any additional spending attached to them because those are job creators for every billion dollars worth of exports it's 10,000 jobs here at home so i really hope the administration starts to pinpoint and look at the real problems that our country is facing so we can get america back to work and we can lead to more economic growth and prosperity because it starts with the american worker Thank you, and to yield back my balance of my time.